Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. We're, welcome to the Corditex uh, Textile Talks for today. And we have a special guest uh, this morning, which I will introduce to you shortly. So for those who missed our Corditex uh, webinars, we have a website, the Cordillera Textile Pro Textiles Project, where you can access all of the uh, previous webinars uh, of the Corditex. So uh, from uh, March 2023 to the present, we will soon upload uh, the webinar with uh, Rebecca uh, Goldsmith later on uh, for those who will you know, miss out or having difficulty with Wi-Fi connection at this time. So that's the Corditex website. It's corditexupb.edu.ph. Okay, so this afternoon we are, uh, this morning we will have uh, Rebecca Goldsmith. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, our resource person for this morning, uh, who is currently based in Hiroshima in Japan. Rebecca Maria Goldsmith is an artist and cultural worker engaging in place-based art and research projects. Her recent work reflects on studies of cultural and land-based practices of her Jewish and Filipino ancestors. She often works in collaboration with local organizations or groups to facilitate the exchange of knowledge intergenerationally and interculturally. She received her MFA, Master's in Fine Arts, from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu in 2020 and is currently pursuing her doctoral studies as a MEX scholar at Hiroshima City University in Japan. So for this session, we are going to explore another interesting material that is used for uh, weaving. And of course, it has also other um, medical and uh, health benefits no, for, for this type of uh, plant uh, uh, called kutsu. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce, uh, we'll have Rebecca uh, for the presentation. Rebecca. Oh, I can hear you guys, but it won't let me start my video. <laughs> it says the host has stopped my video. I'm sorry. Okay, so you can now um, share your slide and start the video. Ah, here we go. Okay, hi. Good morning, morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Ikin, and thank you to the tech team at UP Baguio making our lives easy. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, I'm going to go to, oops, screen share. And let's go here. Can we see that? Yes. And let's go slow. Slideshow. All right. Um, I'm not used to doing webinar format, so it's interesting to not see the audience, but I know you're here, so I'll talk to myself <laughs> and hope that you guys can hear me okay. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, ohayou gozaimasu. I'm here in Hiroshima in Japan. Uh, Shakni Rebecca Maria Goldschmidt. My name is Rebecca Maria Goldschmidt, and I'm an artist, and I'm also a graduate student in the PhD program here at Hiroshima City University. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my research uh, about the plant kuzu, also known as kudzu in America or in English, um, and also known in a uh, language in the Cordillera uh, as ba'ai. And so I'm going to be talking about my work, um, my work as a textile artist, as an artist in general who uses textiles, and also my research on kuzu and how it connects and how I've been tracing it to connect to the histories between the Philippines, Japan, and Hawaii. So I wanted to start um, just by showing you where I am. Uh, this is the view outside my window right here in Hiroshima. And 
it just snowed. So this is just from the other day, the day before yesterday. And this whole area right here is actually a kuzu patch. And this mountain here is called the Yamamotocho. So I live on the back side of the mountains. On the other side of the mountains is the city of Hiroshima in the delta where um, eight different rivers come together and feed into the Seto Naikai, which is the Seto Inland Sea, which is an inland sea with a, a lot of little islands. So I live on the side of a mountain uh, in Western Japan. And I wanted to start by just recognizing the place where I am um, and and the plant that, that I live next door to here uh, in Hiroshima. I have a lot to talk about, so I'll try to do my best and not talk so fast. Um, I also wanted to just start by sharing a little bit about what I've been doing most recently in my art practice, which is organizing around solidarity for Palestine and the Palestinian people. And this isn't exactly kuzu related, but everything is tied into the practice, uh, my work as a social practice artist, my work as a social sculptor, as uh, an artist who works with communities, and as a Jew. And so for me, it's important to start my conversation today by mentioning Palestine and mentioning the work that I'm doing personally as an anti-Zionist Jewish person um, to continuously educate the community here in Hiroshima and connect with other people who have experience and who have um, an interest in ending uh, the the current bombing campaign and the genocide against Palestinian people. So my work relates to plants. Um, my work is about the relationship that people have with plants. And in both Philippine tradition, my family is from the Philippines and also Jewish, German Jews, um, we build altars as a form of memora uh, mem memorializing the dead. And so this was an altar that I just recently built here in Hiroshima just a couple, 10 days ago, uh, to commemorate the 100th day of the um, massacres that are happening right now in Palestine. And again, related to weaving, uh, because I know that's very important. Of course, we're talking about textiles here. Um, this is a kafia that was gifted to us from a community in Tokyo that we received. This building here in the background is the Atomic Bomb Dome, which is the, the main symbol of the anti-nuclear movement. And it's the building that remained standing after the bombing in Hiroshima in 1945. This is me wearing my grandmother's dress with Palestinian embroidery um, in the newspaper here in Hiroshima. And here's the dress a little bit better and a performance that we did on Human Rights Day. Um, also reminding people visually in the Peace Park here in the in the park in Hiroshima. Um, and so we've been standing every night uh, since October 13th, every single night, we have a vigil like this um, to remind people and to share information about Palestine. So I wanted to just start by centering that um, as my actual work in this moment. And my research on Kuzu is related and comes back in because of my interest in the impact of military occupation, um, of, of war and displacement on communities. And I'm essentially using kuzu as a, as a way, as a metaphor and a way to trace how our communities are connected via this plant and um, also other stories of histories, uh, stories and histories of war and displacement and environmental um, degradation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Hiroshima and where, you know, I said where I am, but a little bit about the history of the bomb. So in 1945, on August 6th at 8.15 in the morning, the United States dropped uh, the first nuclear weapon to be used in war. Of course, there had been the Trinity test before that, but this was the first use of a weapon and the only use of a weapon and Nagasaki uh, in in war of a nuclear weapon. And so that the bomb itself just completely flattened and eliminated the entire city. Um, and there were about 40 to 60,000 people who were just evaporated 
um, in that in that moment of the explosion of the bomb where there's a blast, um, there's heat, a blast, and radiation. And afterwards, um, I think between Nagasaki and Hiroshima, around 200,000 people have died to, to, to date um, due to complications from radiation poisoning. Um, and, you know, we know from other uh, histories, nuclear history, that the contamination does live in the soil. It lives in the surrounding area. But of course, the radiation drops off. I, I won't get into like the science of radiation because it's too complicated to talk about now. But um, what's interesting to me is that no matter... Uh, even if the radiation levels are low enough that people can live here, people often think, oh, you can't live in Hiroshima because it's contaminated or the radiation. The radiation is actually low. It's it, it The highest point of radiation is when the bomb explodes. But the contamination of the particles still lives in the soil, still lives in the place around us. It might not be damaging our bodies, um, but it still exists. And to me, coming to Hiroshima and being interested in plants and how people live with plants in their world, in their environment, um, it, it was important to me to learn from the landscape learn from the landscape of Hiroshima. What does the mountain have to say to me? What does the plant that I that I pull from the mountain, what kind of memory does that plant contain? And so I, I began to study the area, um, hiking all around the area where I live, all around Hiroshima, studying the plants, the ecosystem, the water. And um, I learned about the black rain. So the black rain after the bomb um, exploded. There was an immediate storm that happened and rain brought down all of the radiation, the contamination, and that rain cloud moved over uh, an extensive area that has been studied by various people. So this is a map of many maps. Um, it's like a multi-tiered map of where the black rain moved. Um, and so this is the, is the hypocenter. This is the city of Hiroshima. And I live kind of maybe around here. So it's important to me as someone living in this, we can call a post-nuclear or, uh, you know, previously contaminated landscape um, to know what what happened, where did the rain go? And um, I also live in a, I live next to the university. So the university was built in the 1990s and um, through the different stages of development, the mountain has been excavated, um, dug up, the landscape has changed. So I became um, interested in, in the place where I live and the plants around me. And one of those was Kuzu. Um, so, I mentioned or I've introduced myself a little bit in Ilocano. My Ilocano is really bad right now because I'm studying Japanese, but I, I do use some concepts from Ilocano language that I learned and I was studying and researching in Hawaii in the Ilocano language and literature program. And one of those concepts is Nasali Matmut. And I'm sure people um uh, have a sense for folks who are in who are Ilocano speakers and I will just say too if you guys want to introduce yourselves in the chat or if you have questions just throw them in the chat um, I'm a pretty uh, yeah flexible presenter so I, I would love to hear people's comments um, while I'm reading or while I'm presenting um, so Nasali Madmet the concept in Ilocano is using what you got um, being resourceful, being frugal. I think that's a concept that I grew up with from my grandmother and a lot of us grow up with. Um, another idea is called waya waya, which is freedom or independence or liberty. And I just recently did an exhibition here in Hiroshima where we also use the word waya waya to also relate to the Hiroshima ben, the, the Hiroshima dialect um, word waya, which means chaos. And it's a chaos that is just as a is a destructive so it's not just messiness it's kind of a messiness that destroys something else in order to create a new order and so i bring in these concepts because i'm interested in of course my my uh, ilocano ancestry and weaving history our relationship with plants but of course our linguistics and our language and our philosophies that are embedded in our language. So these are kind of some of the concepts that I'm drawing into my work, um, especially with Nasali Medmet and using what you've got. Um, it was very important to me for many uh, reasons to work with a material that was abundant, that was free, 
um, that I don't have to buy my yarn from the store. I can make my own materials um, and, and that it's coming from the landscape itself and that because it's coming from the landscape, it's embedded with the memory of the landscape itself. So here's me outside the place where I live here in the dorm in Hiroshima. Um, in the summer, this is the first summer that I came, 2022, and um, pulling out the um, vines in the kuzu patch. And I'll talk a little bit about kuzu history in Japan. I don't want to go too much into it, although I do have some beautiful slides. Um, but the history of kuzu is long, and um, it is the oldest uh, woven textile in Japan. And it came, the culture of using it came from China and also is used in Korea. And it has been used for clothing, for the robes of priests, for baskets, for interior clothing, kind of underwear clothing, for shrouds, for burial. Um, and I want to also mention my uh, sensei, Murai sensei, who is based in Shizuoka, who's a kuzufu weaver and master and sensei. And I've been studying with him for the past couple of years. And um, But I originally just looked it up on YouTube. So I, I knew that kuzu could be a fiber. I had heard about it before and I thought, well, I could try to see if I can make it, you know? So looking at the mountain and saying, well, what, what plants do we have around here? What can I work with? The kuzu just kind of really reached out to me. Um, so I started on YouTube. I started uh, making the cloth myself that the winter that I got here, which was October of 2021. And then, um, and then I came across an article by Murai Sensei where he talks about the importance of maintaining the culture of our natural fibers and our natural cloths here in Japan. And so from reading his work, he kind of breaks down the steps of how to do it. So then I compounded the YouTube stuff, what I was learning just from doing the work by hand. And then I contacted him and I said, since I would like to study with you. And he said, great, we're having a workshop in Okoyama. You should just come. So that was in 2022. Um, so going back to the history a little bit, um, Kuzu is also an extremely invasive species in the U.S. I'm sure there's people who are here or listening who are living in the American South, Georgia, uh, the Virginias, Tennessee, all that is um, totally, totally covered in kuzu. And as a kid, we had family who lived in Georgia. And I remember, I'm sure I have pictures back like when I was maybe 13, um, visiting Georgia and just seeing the vines totally covered on the side of the road. And and um, it was such a big joke, you know, that Kuzu was this monster, that the monster that ate the South. And so that to me is also part of this history, although um, also because I have family in the South, uh, Filipinos and, and Jewish uh, and, uh, family members. Um, although I'm not connected to that place, I grew up in Chicago. Um, it is part of the American history of how that plant moved and how it was brought to the U.S. and used as a solution to agricultural problems, the Dust Bowl. And it was really like a kind of also get rich quick uh, scheme for um, the agricultural U.S. agriculture to just plant a ton of kuzu all over the south and um i don't know if lb is here but lb from kuzu culture and a lot of folks um in the in the south have been doing a lot of research on how that plant can how kuzu can be used in the american southern context and also has a metaphorical relationship to this um kind of racial undertones of kuzu being deemed uh an asian invasion kind of plant and how it's related to its chinese and japanese history and how that gets overlaid and played into the racial context of the american south so i'm gonna leave that to my um <laughs> comrades over there who are doing that work um but it, it also you know kuzu in the pacific has not really been studied that much and so that's where my work comes in so i think we are all of course entangled and connected um i want to mention those guys over there but my work has really been focused on japan philippines and also a little bit in hawaii so it's military use in the pacific it's also been brought to fiji to be used as camouflage cover um and i just mentioned here at the bottom uh the preservation societies the hozonkai which are groups that are working to, to protect traditional 
um, uh, weight processes and materials and ways of working together as a collective, because processing any plant material is probably a lot of you guys know, takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it also is a collective experience experience. So me working by myself, drawing the fibers from the mountain, isn't really how most people would have done this process. It would have been a group of women or a group of people working together historically um, to, to draw the fiber, weave it, make cloth, etc. So I'll show a couple slides from um, Kuzunoha, which is the mythology, uh, a Japanese folk story of uh, Kitsune, which is a, a fox, a magical fox character um, who had the name Kuzu no Ha, which means the, the leaf of the Kuzu. So you can see here the vine. Um, and the story of Kuzu no Ha is um, there was a, a fox in the forest who was being hunted by uh, an army, by a general. And a man comes across the fox in the forest and he rescues the fox and brings it back to his home. And uh, he avoids the, you know, she, uh, the fox avoids the death by this in, uh, incoming military component uh, or military group. And so um, <laughs> the, the guy saves the fox and the fox is very thankful and then runs away. And then the guy in uh, finds a woman and they fall in love and they get married and they have a child. And this child is actually the child of the kitsune herself. Because the kitsune, the fox who was saved, was so grateful to this man that she converted into her human form. They became uh, a couple and had a child. And the child is also a magical child um, um, because he's the, the progeny of this magical fox and a human. But the kitsune is also uncomfortable always living in the human world, and she's also a weaver. And so um, at a certain point, she is at the loom, and she's tired, and she's resting on her loom, and the child sees her in her kitsune form. He sees her in her fox form, and she's so ashamed that she runs away, and she abandons the family, and she scrawls a poem on the shoji screen that says, come, I'm sorry I had to leave you, but come look for me in the forest and my my leaves are silvery and you can find me there. And so she claims the kuzu form then. So she transforms from a fox to a human and then goes back to the forest as kuzu. And so the in the in the mind uh, in the mythology of Japan, the kuzu is actually a mother who has abandoned her family. So I I'm just want to share that story. Um, and then this is an image again from the forage crop for the southeast, where the Americans were bringing um, kuzu to grow to cover uh, for crop cover and feed in the American South. And here's another depiction. I'm sorry of um, kuzu no ha with her. Uh, running back into the forest with her kuzu kimono. And another a little bit more historical context of the kuzu cloth. Um, this is a samurai general uh, armor. And underneath that armor, Murai Sensei has identified that um, the, the underwear of the samurai is, is made out of kuzu. And these are different um ritual i guess we'll call them like clothes of uh idai of like kind of noble he people or or priests um the cloth is not just used for every day uh it was used for like because of its shine and its luster also used for like um wealthy class so i'll get into oh gosh i have so much to say here we go um I'm going to get into the actual process because I know a lot of people want to know about the process itself. So basically, um, from what I've learned from Udai Sensei and also from all the different uh, artists I've talked to, how people do their, their processing, basically go into the field and cut lengths of vine um, that have leaves on them, cut off the leaves and wrap coils 
Um, this is the first batch that I did. So the coils are quite small because I didn't know. Murai Sensei wraps really big coils around his arm. So they're like big circles like this. And you basically make a fermentation bed out of grass. You throw all the coils into a big pile of grass and you cover it and you leave it there for a couple of days and you check the temperature to make sure it's hot enough. And then you wash it out in the river and then you can pull out a sort of shiny light fiber. There's various levels to the core of the um of the vine itself um and these are photos that my assistant donna took this summer when we were doing our process i think this was like the fourth or fifth time i had already done this here on the mountain so i was like getting to a really good flow uh working in the dye studio with really big pots so i can boil a ton and just really pro this was the biggest harvest that i did this summer um with donna and Dana's actually grew up in Israel. Um, so we had a lot of conversations while we were working about life, about love, about war, about peace, about all that kind of stuff. And so to me, the process of actually harvesting and making and everything that we're talking about, everything that we're doing is imbuing the material itself as much as the material has, has, is containing the memory of the landscape the working with the material itself is also receiving our ideas our our energy our thinking um so all of that is coming together in 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 the cloth uh when it comes together in the end so these are just more slides of what the process looks like of pulling out the fiber and this was the first tiny little piece that i made it's probably about this big maybe. Um, and I did this all by hand and on a cardboard loom. So I didn't actually work on the loom at that time. This was all over the winter. It was the first time I was in Japan and I was like weaving on this tiny little cardboard loom, but you can see um, it's not very consistent fiber, but I was able to do from the YouTube videos, this small little weaving. Um, and then let's see, oops, I don't know if I can get this to play. I tried this earlier, but oh, uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Okay. This is the process of um, washing the cemented. You can see the coils into the stream. Um, and then I would just sit in the stream by my house here and uh, pull it out. It, and by him, I also mean it's really just like a watchman. It's the channel that um, has been uh, built into the into the. Um, mountainside here so it's not a natural stream it's it's actually a, an agricultural channel so um, this is not like going into the um, in Shizuoka when we're in the big beautiful river coming down the mountain this is kind of like a gutter <laughs> a gutter of the uh, area where I live and so after pulling all those threads uh, pulling the fibers then um, I set up the loom with help from my sensei, Noda sensei, who's uh, also uh, an amazing teacher and master weaver from Kyoto, who I work with here at Hiroshima City University. I would never be able to do all of this uh, without the support of my teachers. And this is me um, holding the, I think this is probably the first weaving that I did on the loom, coming off the loom um, in Hiroshima, uh, in Tokyo. I brought it with me to show some people in Tokyo. Let's see. Okay, so a little bit more. This is just photos of the workshop. This is also sharing um, some of Murai Sensei's collection of some of those pieces that we saw earlier, the photographs. He actually has a beautiful, beautiful collection of kuzu fu. Fu means cloth, kuzu cloth. Um, and here he is showing us how to do the hakko, how to do the uh, no, fermentation bed. Here we are washing the cloth in the stream. Everyone's super happy with their fibers and then this is a kuzu tempura so i do want to mention i know um there are people who are interested in the in the medicinal qualities and the food aspect of kuzu i am not totally a focused expert on this but i do eat it i do use it and i do think it's important to use and i've i even have recipe japanese recipe books on how to use it um it's used for a cold cool noodle in the summer that's like a sweet has a sweet sauce on it i've had kuzu mochi i've had kuzu um tea uh someone just recently gifted me like a kuzu um what do you call it? it's actually kuzu and yuzu which is the 
orange, a yellow, like a kind of le lemon orange, yuzu, citrus, um, a kuzu yuzu ocha, like a tea that you drink when you're sick. Um, so the, the plant itself is not only uh, extremely useful historically for the fiber, but also as a medicine, has an enormous root that is still being used and harvested for its powder, also sometimes called arrowroot powder. Um, but the, the kudzu powder is used as a medicine for fevers, to bring down fevers for colds, for a sore throat. Um, it's used... Um, it kind of has a fame for being a cure for alcoholism and people use it as a remedy, like a detox remedy for drinking um, alcohol. And so, um, of course, you can eat the leaves, you can make a tea out of the leaf. And this is the tempura from the what Mudai Sensei calls the me, the eye of the shoot so like the young shoots like so if, if there's iloconos in the room and we eat the kamote shoots or we eat the like fresh shoot coming off of a lot of different plants the bitter melon whatever that's what you would eat from, from the kuzu as well so i do want to mention that um it does have medicinal qualities it does have historical um importance in Chinese medicine. And that is also part of what kuzu culture folks are doing in the American South is making tincture, um, what you call, you guys are making uh, like from the flower also making different kind of fermentations and stuff like that. So again, this is just pulling out the fiber in the workshop, um, tying the knots of the fiber uh, because something that's unique about kuzu is that it's not a spun fiber. So luckily I'm in a room with a bunch of textile nerds, so you understand the um, different vocabulary and stuff around fibers. But, you know, when we think about spinning cotton or wool or other plant fibers, even kuzu is actually an end-to-end -end knotted thread. And so after you pull the thread from the mountain, then um, I basically sit in my studio and knot it duk, with a special knot that Mudai Sensei showed us, which is the knot that he learned from his family. Um, and then you just make a big pile and then make um, uh, set up your skein with a certain kind of uh, like figure eight on a chopstick. We make a figure eight on a chopstick and set that into a special shuttle. And then when you're weaving, you weave it um, sort of damp. So the, the material is a little bit more flexible and it's not breaking, although it is very strong. Um, weaving with it damp allows a little bit more uh, flexibility and less kind of cracking, which is something that I learned from Mudai Sensei. Um, so this is last summer's Shizuoka Gokken workshop. And we also worked with Indigo. Um, and indigo was also a traditional color used on the kuzufu. And from Mudai Sensei, one of the most important things that I learned also from him was the importance of the dye as medicine. So the dye itself, the indigo, uh, the this is the gardenia seed, many different natural dyes and the color system of Japan is, is renowned for being um, just very beautiful, but also a medicinal uh, color scheme that's drawn from the plants of the earth. So if now we're wearing clothes that are synthetic and we're wearing clothes that are based in petroleum and based in systems of extraction, like most of our clothes have some kind of plastic in them at this point. Um, so I will mention that, you know, a lot of my research is because I'm interested in in creating a process of working that is kind to the earth and that is in collaboration with the earth. And I think that's, you know, through working with Kuzu, I've created that process and also have been able to study the ways in which our uh, economies are not allowing for these processes to happen very easily. It's a lot more convenient and easy to go to H&M or to go to another fast fashion uh, store to buy our cloth, to buy our clothes. But what's actually happening, because our skin is so porous and so absorbent, we're actually absor um, absorbing the toxic materials that those clothes are made of through our skin itself. And so one of the 
main important teachings that I'm getting from my teachers here is that natural fibers are essential, not only because they allow us to have a relationship, they they are our relationship with plant materials and the earth and and also, of course, animal materials, if you're working with wolves and stuff like that. But that the dyes that we use that are also plant-based are imbued into the cloth and that that cloth is then on our skin when we are absorbing that medicine from the plant. And that's also, you know, in the Cordillera and many other places all over the world that work with plant materials are traditional ways of working. Those are our medicines for our, for our body. Um, so again, here's just some more slides from the weaving studio. And then um, another important aspect of this big longest weaving that I did um, was working with the seasons and working with the time. So um, when there's a full moon, you do certain things. A lot of uh, learnings that I've had from my plant medicine teachers um, in California are about when to harvest, right? And I think a lot of us, it's easy to say, oh, I just got to go out now because my time or I have a deadline. But I think it is important to work with um, the seasons because that the plants themselves are working on a clock, a clock that is dictated by the moon, it's dictated by the sun, the rain, everything. Um, so in living in relationship with the mountain here, I have to study like, okay, well, when does it rain? When is the best time? When is that? When is you know, just kind of tracing. And it's not perfect, but these are just ways that I use for myself to practice being in relationship with this place. So when um, I was about to finish this weaving, there was a, a, an eclipse. Um, and most times you're not supposed to go out into the eclipse, but because the work that I was doing with this piece was really about the history between Japan and Philippines and thinking about the sex slavery, uh, the imperialistic occupation of the Philippines by Japan in the, in the uh, 1940s, 41 to 45. Um, and I was thinking a lot about this cloth itself as holding the trauma of um, women's experience. Um, I really wanted to bring the cloth into this kind of what we would think of the, like a bad light of the eclipse and to expose it to that light and to work with the natural dyes under that time frame. And so I went with some other uh, people from who I live with here in the dorm, international students, and we had this conversation about um, the impact of war on our communities that, that we all told stories of our different family members and what they experienced during World War II. And we used with our hands, we hand sort of did like a sort of hand squeezed ecot, or like um, binding the spot with our hand and then painting the dye around our hands. And this is the kind of weird, funky ecot, not even ecot, but some kind of strange pattern that came out of that experience of um, sharing and working together on that. And I built that into this sort of altar, this tall sculpture uh, made of bamboo that was basically an offering and a holding of that cloth. And while I was listening or while I was making the thread, I was listening to audiobooks that were um, uh, about many different things, including uh, novels about uh, World War II, um, stories about Philippines and Japan, the history, uh, a diary uh, called Hiroshima Diary of a doctor who was here in Hiroshima after the bomb. So again, I'm trying to, um, every part of the process imbues this cloth with meaning and metaphor. Um, yeah, I'm just going to check my time here. Okay, keeping going. And Professor Ikin, you just tell me when you can cut me off because I have a little bit more to share. Yeah, sure. Um, this is the Thank you. This is the beautiful kuzu flower over the summer. And this is my hakko on my fermentation bed that I just put on the side of the mountain. So under there is the um, kuzu fermenting. And this is the cross section of the hairy vine when it's cut. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Hawaii before I get into the Philippines. I don't want to say that much because I'm going to go back in the summer and do a little bit more research. But um, I was in 
on the big island, uh, working with my friend Manang Nadine Ortega, who's a political science student, uh, also Ilocano teacher, my Ilocano teacher at the University of Hawaii. And we went to Big Island to interview some Ilocano women about their experience migrating to Hawaii from the Philippines. And in that process of um, staying with other Ilocano elders there, people who grew up in Big Island, who grew up in Honoka'a, uh, we went to the local museum, a community museum and community center that has documentation of the different communities who lived in the plantations. So one thing that is very important about Hiroshima Hawaii history and how they connect, because what I'm trying to do is use Kuzu as a method of connecting all our different stories between these different communities. Um, Kuzu is one of a million, literally a million invasive species in Hawaii. It's uh, very prolific, but there's also a ton of other invasive species that are kind of competing. So Kuzu, um, according to the uh, different invasive species commissions on different or committees on different islands, um, it's kind of almost like a lost cause. They're not trying to eliminate it. It's just there. It's basically naturalized itself. And it was brought supposedly in the 1940s to a ranch called Aina Hole on Big Island, which was built by a Hawaiian and American um, mixed, uh, I believe he was a lawyer, and his idea in creating this garden was actually a retreat for, it was his like retreat home in case the Japanese won the war. And so again, thinking about all these kind of racist ideas of Asians in Hawaii, Asians in American South or the American context, the way that Japan was portrayed during the war, um, the kuzu was brought by this person to Hawaii and ended up overgrowing and coming out of um, of that place. And it was controlled in the 90s by a invasive species committee. And now it's just kind of all over in different places on, I'm specifically thinking about Hawaii Island, Big Island. Um, so when I wrote the committee, I said, do you guys know where I could find some kuzu? Because my idea was I wanted to, you know, um, use the fiber from that place to tell these stories and uh they said okay yeah you can go check it out it's behind the ark um in hilo and so for um those who don't know the ark is an organization that supports people with disabilities and so in the parking lot of the ark me and nadine drive up and i'm like looking for the kuzu where is it where is it where is it and i see a version of it in the trees but this is like up high in the trees, the still from a video, but below it. So like what we could actually reach was totally just slashed and burned by probably Roundup or some other kind of weed killer um, because it's just so uh, takes over so much. Um, they had, you know, on the this is like an edge of a parking lot by a building uh, into like a kind of more forested area. And it was just totally covered, uh, totally destroyed and burned by, by weed killer. And so I was like, okay, well, we're not going to use that because we don't want to just handle all of that materials. Um, but it made me then realize like my, my research in Hawaii was almost a dead end. It was like a ghost of Kuzu. Um, and that made me really think about, you know, just presence and um, absence of the plant and how that also revealed a whole other, uh, another side of just contamination that we deal with in our everyday lives um, through things like glyphosates, through uh, other kinds of weed killers, contamination, and also, of course, the military occupation of Hawaii that also uses so much um uh, we call them the PFAS, the the forever chemicals that are also um, embedded into the ecosystem in Hawaii and many other places uh, in that are next to military bases. So when I got to Hawaii, I was expecting to be able to use kuzu, but what I really came up against was uh, an entire, you know, history of um, chemical use of, uh, you know, even the woman that we were staying with, one of our manangs, her husband was in the Vietnam War, and she was telling us about his history of becoming extremely disabled because of his exposure to napalm 
that he was flying and um, he was a pilot in the Vietnam War and dropping napalm over Vietnam, um, he as hit in his body uh, was became severely disabled because of that work that he was doing. And so again, um, we were next to the ARC, which is a site of, of center for support of center with disabilities. Um, we're e encountering Kuzu and Kuzu was really revealing to us um, all these different stories about contamination, disability, our bodies, and how how that how that all is interconnected and related. And I also want to mention here on the left um, this photograph of the Allegre family that's in the Honoka'a Community Center. This is a Filipino Japanese family, um, which was also pretty rare, uh, even in the plantation system. From Hiroshima, there were many, many families that migrated to Hawaii, to Kauai Island, to Big Island, to Oahu, to work in the plantations. Um, and I'll probably, you can read about this in the book one day, <laughs> but um, the relationships between Filipinos and Japanese uh, is very complicated, um, but there were not that many families, integrated families. And so this is one example of a Filipino Japanese family that was living in Big Island. And to me, all of the um, stories of military histories, plantation histories, colonial histories, um, often kind of obscure our interrelated and familial kind of relations. And so I think it's important not only to use Kuzu to reveal, you know, the awful things that colonialism has wrought upon our lands, but also the interactions and the interconnectedness that has grown because of uh, these different um, relationships that we have with each other because of these bigger systems. So, okay, now we're finally here in the Philippines um, with Professor Ikin uh, at the Cordy Tech studio. Um, so flash forward to September 2023. I had a beautiful visit there. Um, we just like couldn't stop talking. We couldn't stop talking about all the interesting connections that we have in, in, in our studies. Um, and I was interested in coming to the Philippines to connect to Cordytex because of the presence of Kuzu in the Cordillera. And so through a series of random rabbit holes that I went down in my research, I came across the name of the town Kabayan. And from studying Ilocano um, and reading about uh, Kabayan as the center of the um, mummies, the fire mummies that are buried in the burial caves in Kabayan, um, I thought, oh, Kabayan, Kabayan. Uh, I had read that Ba'ai was the word for Kuzu. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't know if it's Ibaloi language. It would make sense if it's Ibaloi because that's the Ibaloi center. But I, from my studies of Ilocano, I thought, oh, Ka and An at the end, that means the place of something, right? So Kabayan, I thought maybe that means there's Ba'ai there. I don't know. And I found um, other uh, documentation from the mummies history uh, and the docu uh, the research that a botanist at UP Baguio has done about how the mummies were preserved through plant materials, through smoking them with tobacco and guava and I think, Patani um, materials. Um, in her research, she mentions Ba'ai and the and the vine in Kabayan. I was like, oh my gosh, that must be Kuzu, right? I mean, if that's the word for Kuzu. Anyways, so I nerded out on that for a while. And then I contacted Professor Ikin and I said, I'm interested in coming to see if this plant is used in any capacity in the Cordillera and how it might relate. Um, so I came and... Um, I went to Kabayan and I went to the museum uh, at UP Baguio, which you guys are at. I'm sure you've seen this show. A uh, beautiful exhibition of weaving of the Cordillera. I mean, I wish I could have spent, I, I got to come back. That's, that's the main point. Um, but uh, for those who are not familiar in the Cordillera, we have a long history of beautiful textiles, natural dyes, um, so many different styles and uh, Every community has their own expression and their own 
um, not only way of working, but materials of working. And then also this relationship of Ilocano uh, lowland culture with the mountain culture and the overlap and the interaction between the communities and then materials that are coming from overseas historically, like beads and um you know, porcelain. And there's just so such a beautiful, rich history in the Cordillera that I'm not going to talk that much about today. But um, I was mainly interested in seeing if Kuzu has any kind of history there and what that might be. Um, so I went, uh, my auntie uh, had a the driver of her church <laughs> take me up to Cabayan. Thank you, uncle, <laughs> uh, from Baguio. And um, this is a view of the burial caves from the road. So the mummies, um, some of the mummies are located here. And we went together to the um, a Cabayan Weaving Center. And thanks to Professor Ikin and, and your student, I was able to connect with the folks at the Weaving Center. Um, but on the road to uh, Cabayan was so many landslides. I had never been up in the Cordillera, like along these roads, very steep roads, um, very narrow, so much water, so beautiful, so much just water gushing everywhere. Um, but of course, in Hiroshima too, we have a major problem with landslides. And so here you can see um, the, the side of the mountain collapsing. And this is actually kuzu growing, the ba'ai growing on the side of the mountain. And I mean, I'm not an ecological or I'm not a landscape architect or someone who can repair engineer <laughs> sides of mountains but to me because kuzu has been I, I know that kuzu has been used in erosion control i imagined that this place at one time was covered in kuzu and that maybe that was one of the reasons that the mountains were stable i'm not sure i'm just totally guessing here but um you can see the kuzu here and you can see the collapse of the mountain side here here's just another view that i shot on film of of what that kuzu looks like in in the place and this is the Cabayan Mummy Museum, which is part of the National Museum of the Philippines. Um, it's actually closed. It was closed that day. And it's also, I don't know if they've opened it already, but um, this is a site where they do have a mummy on site. And they also have different items, historical and community items from the community, uh, uh, from the local folks, uh, Ibaloy people uh, who... Um, live in Cabayan. And this is also the, when you walk into the garden, beautiful garden, uh, this is the Ba'ai. This is the uh, Kuzu growing kind of in the centerpiece here. And it was, it was a very exciting, it was a very exciting day because I didn't know if we would find the Kuzu. We didn't really know where to to go to see it. Um, the weaver that we spoke with said, yes, we have used it for threads or we have used it to tie firewood in the forest in the past, but no one really uses it anymore. It's kind of like um, even when I was looking through books, I went to the library at UP Baguio, I went to Mount Cloud bookshop and looked at all the books about plants and there was nothing. I couldn't find a single page about Ba'ai or about Kuzu or Kudzu and all its different names. Um, so I was just really thinking maybe it's not there, maybe we can't find it. Um, but the weaver did tell me an interesting story about the name of the town Kabayan having previously been Kabayan, Kabayan with a double A. And she said, yeah, but I think when the Americans came, you know, in the early 1900s, I think when the Americans came, they couldn't say it. So they just changed the name to Kabayan because it's easier to say. And I thought, wow. So basically the American occupation then erased the actual name of the plant from the place itself. So what we should really call it is Kabayan, Kabayan with the double A, with the Ka place of Ba'ai. Uh, integrated. Um, and uh, again, this is all our oral histories. These are what people are telling me. So I'm not sure, but we can confirm. And I think this is something that I'd be interested in. The work that I'd be interested in doing and coming back to Cordy, Texas is, is digging deeper into Ba'ai and its presence and why this, um, uh, the Ibaloi settlement, the place that is the center of Ibaloi culture in the Cordillera, which is very, very old, um, you know, uh, living 
living uh, community of the Ibaloi people, why it was named after this plant that's there that has that is it's very important that we listen to our um place names is what i'm trying to say and the fact that that has kind of changed over time i think is interesting to me and indicative of um influence from you know outside community oh my gosh i could go on and on also went to uh, Mindanao over the summer um, and working with a group called Farm Co-op. Um, and I was teaching photography classes with a friend of mine, uh, two different um, banana farming communities who are interested in telling their own stories about what they're doing in their communities and how they're maintaining their autonomous lands and farming bananas. And so I went to the Bagobo community in Sibulan in Mindanao, which is at the um, kind of come um, down from Mount Apo. I also want to mention that Mount Pulag, of course, the second highest mountain is right next to Kabaayan. And then I went to Mindanao, Mount Apo, which is the tallest mountain in the Philippines, which is right next to Sibulan. So I had this experience of being next to these giant peaks and um and 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 learning about Kuzu next to the tallest mountain ancestors in the Philippines. And so these are uh, uh uh, folks from the Bagobo community who were showing me how they're using kuzu as a crop cover, as a ground cover underneath their bananas to support the maintaining moisture and different um, creating uh, organic banana farming, experimenting using different crop cover underneath. And um, I learned more about their community and how the Japanese came in the early 1900s to establish abaka uh, abaca farms, abaca plantations to create rope uh, for World War One, And then, uh, of course, the Japanese came again in the 1940s to occupy, to occupy the Philippines. And um, the hotel that I stayed at actually was, it was so bizarre. It was called the Japanese Tunnel. And it was next to an underground tunnel system that the Japanese had built. They're very famous for that. I learned a lot of stories about, you know, the the golden Buddha and this like treasure hunters and all of the mythologies of the Japanese theft of the gold of the Philippines and how that might be buried in tunnels. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, but, you know, learning more about the Japanese history in Mindanao, I also realized how integrated the communities really still are. Not only um, people coming, uh, people having Japanese ancestors, Japanese Bagobo intermixed families, but then also folks who have gone back to Japan. So maybe you had great uh, grandfather, great grandfather who's Japanese. You can actually have Japanese citizenship. And through that citizenship, you can come and work in Japan. So a lot of the people, you know, that I was with on this, this couple of days, some people spoke Japanese, some people had worked in Japan. So we had a lot of fun um, kind of thinking about how we're related in these ways, you know, as Filipinos who have relationship to Japan. Um, I mean, they're indigenous Bagobo people who have relationship to Japan and how that all kind of mixes and tangles together. So we went through the whole process of um, cutting the kuzu, coiling it, boiling it, and fermenting it over the few days that I was there. And then they gifted me that material to take back with me that I have in the studio. So this is everyone... Um, at the banana farm in the community in Sibulan. And then I ended up in Manila where I went to see Kuzu in the herbarium, the National Herbarium at the uh, National Museum, uh, which was another amazing and interesting experience of seeing uh, these dried specimens of kuzu from three distinct locations. So I had also, it's a very uh, interesting experience just trying to get access to the National Museum for anyone who's a researcher or who anyone who's interested in digging into archives. Um, very, very interesting. A lot of paperwork, a lot of just loop hoops having to jump through uh, to just even be able to see these. So uh, this is a really special uh, 
image, I think. Um, but these three pieces, uh, three collections were made in different years. The earliest one is 1912, and then 1958, 1964. And um, many of you might know that in the 1940s during the occupation, um, the museum, the herbarium was actually burned down. And so the collection was I don't think totally lost, but I think mostly lost. And so some of these pieces were actually doubles. So I think what the botanists do is they go and they collect samples, you know, they collect the whole plant, if they can get the flower and the vine and the leaf and the seed and all of its various forms. And then they'll make doubles or triple copies and send it out to other herbariums all over the world. Um, so some of these, you can't really see it here, but they have stamps that say, from University of Nebraska <laughs> or like, you know, random other institutions that had collected these items ended up returning them back to the Philippines to rebuild the collection. So there's a really interesting history just in the the many layers of people who have gone through, made notes. Um, and so it was an honor to be able to see the kuzu in this way. Um, and, you know, mostly only really scientists get to look at this stuff. So so um, I will say that one of the most interesting informations that came from this, I think, was from the piece that came from Zamboanga. So there were three different locations. One was from Batanes, uh, which is really wonderful connection up into uh, Japan and Okinawa. Uh, the other was from Zamboanga and the other was from Mindanao. And so the 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 sample from Zamboanga had a note and there's a note here that says uses and it'll say agricultural or economic or whatever. And one of them said ritual. And so I, I have no idea what that means. I don't know how it could be used in ritual. I have no other information besides the one word that just says ritual. And it could be any kind of interpretation. But to me, I think that was a really important indication of just the importance of the plant itself. So even though, you know, in Japan, kuzu is on the side of the road, no one pays attention to it. In Georgia, in America, the it's a side a plant on the side of the road. Everyone just wants to kill it. Uh, in the Philippines, maybe it's being used as a crop cover. Maybe it's kind of also in kaba kabayan. In kabayan, it's been erased from the place name. But then here in this um, paper hidden in a museum collection, it has a tiny little note that just says ritual. And to me, I think that's just one of the most beautiful things that I found about this plant and tracing it to the Philippines is that it is a native plant in the Philippines. It's, it's, it is one of our native plants. It, it should be treated like all other plants with respect and dignity. And um, it doesn't have to be a trash plant that we just hose with um, herbicides to kill it. I think it's important that we recognize that these plants do have a, a relationship with us. And so this was a great indication that it's not only a use for, you know, tying the firewood, which is also very important, but it also probably had a ritual use as well. Um, and I'm going to talk just a little tiny bit oof, about um, Okinawa because I just went there and this also ties in and this is also part of how I'm trying to connect again these histories of of uh, Japan and Philippines and Hawaii and Okinawa is in between and, and totally relates here. Um, these are just images of me visiting and talking to different weavers and uh, the most important thing about going to Okinawa for me is to continue my um, thinking around my work as an anti-war practice, my work as an environmentalist artist, and my work as someone who's a peacemaker, someone who's thinking about material and community and how it comes together to tell stories so we can build peace in our communities. And that, that involves um, reconciliation and confrontation of our past histories, and it also involves working and building together. And so in Okinawa, this is a, a textile that I pulled out of the sea. It was like an old giant sandbag that I pulled out of the sea. I had a residency with Maumi residencies uh, with Val and um, the folks uh, on Ishigakijima. Um, and this is uh, Setsuko-san, who's an uh, anti-war activist, um, in her 80s and her friend uh, looking at a book in front of that weaving 
And um, this is a community share of plant knowledge that we did while I was there, inviting different farmers and, uh, you know, craftspeople, weavers, just people with gardens, our next door neighbors, a fisherman, a different Ishigaki-jima community. We all came together to share more about the plants of Ishigaki, um, which are, it's very famous um, place for um uh, not only plant cultivation, but foraging and having very unique plant ecosystems that's also related to um, the Philippines and to Japan. Um, oops, wait, there was not one more slide here. Okay, I must have missed it. Oh, Kore. Ano, I wanted to show you guys uh, Setsuko-san, who, when I was asking her, did you guys ever use kuzu? Or have you heard of this plant kuzu? She's like, yeah, yeah, we have kuzu. And she brought me this basket that um, her cousin... Uh, or her friend um, uh, Michan actually made. So this is the weaver that made this basket. Um, but the plant is totally different. It's also called kuzu in Ishigaki language, um, but it's a totally different plant sitting here. Um, so that was another really beautiful experience of just uh, of the word and the linguistics and the overlap and the entanglement of what the word even means in, in Japanese or Ishigaki and how there's a connection there. And Setsuko-san has been, um, since the 1970s, uh, very active in, in stopping development in Ishigaki-jima. And unfortunately, the Japanese military recently opened last year, last March, a brand new missile launch pad base, uh, which is just directly behind Michan's house, the woman who made this basket. And so the base there uh, has a big water catchment system that, you know, we know from Okinawa, from Naha, from um, all the different uh, anti-base movements in Okinawa, that the contamination from the base really has ruined water systems all over the islands. And um, so Michan, who grows her own kozo, she grows her own mulberry to feed her silkworms. I'll go back to that slide. This is her basket of her homegrown and home woven silk um, from her trees. Michan's house right over here um, ha now has a giant missile base next to it because of the impending war against China, Taiwan, and the militarization, the rapid militarization that's happening here in Japan and in the Philippines. Um, our weavers and our uh, material culture is also being threatened by these this ramping up to war um, because no matter what the runoff from that base is going to come directly into her pineapple fields. It will come directly into her sugar cane. It'll come directly into her kozo. And that will contaminate with, we know, the PFAS, the uh, polyfluor chemicals. Um, that will contaminate <laughs> the silk, which then we will wear on our bodies. And so uh, what I'm trying to do is make these bigger connections, yeah? make these bigger loops um, and connections and entanglements between our communities, how we're connected um, through these histories of war and how now, even right now, today, um, and that's why what's happening in Palestine is so important, is because all of our experiences with war, our displacements, and our current entanglement with the weapons industries um, is affecting our personal bodies, it's affecting our community experiences, and it's affecting and ruining, ruining our um, relationship with our lands. So um, I know uh, I want to just wrap it up here. I said so much, and I'm sure people have questions. But these are just some takeaways. And I love this picture that Donna took of me in the bush uh, over the summer. Um, my work is really about building relationship to land wherever you are. Uh, and there's a Jewish group um, uh, uh called the Bund that has a concept called doikait. It means here-ness. It's about being here, building relationship here in the now, being a good neighbor, being a good, um, being in good relations. And that's also something that I've learned with elders uh, in different places in Hawaii, here in Japan, in the Philippines, in Okinawa, uh, learning from the Hibakusha, who are the um, survivors of the atomic weapon here in Hiroshima in Nagasaki or the global hibakusha people who have grown up in contaminated lands from uh testing like in uh the Mariana or in the um 
in the in Bikini Atoll in Rongelap, Micronesia. Um, so learning from our indigenous communities and communities that are also living exposed to the contamination of military uh, bases, um, listening to the plants themselves, what does the plant and the mountain actually have to say? And that's not going to speak maybe in words, that's an intuitive experience of just being on the mountain and being in, in the field and just listening with your body. Um, and then really thinking, I'm thinking about kuzu as a metaphor, a metaphor for our entanglement, our interactions, the total freaking mess of, of our experience as humans in this particular moment of, you know, AI technology wars. Um, and also the waya waya, the freedom in that chaos and the chaos in the freedom, what that looks like. And again, yeah, just drawing it back to um, this work as peacemaking, this work as a method of anti-war anti -war activism. Nothing is perfect. Clearly the wars are continuing and um, I'm, I'm praying for the best for our region that we're in now in Japan and Taiwan and Philippines and Okinawa. Um, but what's happening in Palestine has raised the bar so high for what the international community is willing to tolerate that we're not sure where things will go from here. Um, so my work is just a humble uh, way of me um, using my uh, place in time and space and relationship to where I am, to the communities where I am, um, to continue to resist, uh, to continue to speak to the war crimes, to the contamination, to the destruction, but to also remember and to elevate and lift up all of our stories of connection, all of our stories of interconnectedness and relationship with humans, with our plant species, with all of our living world around us, because at the end of the day, it's all connected. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. So thank you everyone so much for listening. I'm sorry, I probably went a little bit over. Um, and there's some couple really specific questions here. Um, Professor Ikin, do you want to say anything or should I just go straight to questions? Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for that very awesome presentation, no? very inspiring work uh, that you're working on. So uh, let me just begin with some questions here uh, that we received from our audience. Uh, they wanted to ask, uh, first, in the process uh, of making, no? how long does it take to process the fiber before the kutsu uh, is uh, uh, ready for weaving and uh, second uh when does it grow during the like if you look at the let's say one year agricultural cycle uh in hiroshima or have you asked in kabayan um uh, when does it grow in abundance like in a year in a like what season um yeah yeah yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure about Kabayan, but for Japan, the the height of the growth season is in the summer. It's so hot in Japan. I mean, it's really hot in the Philippines, but man, the summer in Japan is so humid. And um, so usually the pictures that I was showing, like this picture, I believe, is in July. Um, so the mountain really goes off man it's just covered like it's just totally covered it climbs up all the poles the whole mountain is just green 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 from the kuzu usually like june july august um i was harvesting even up until october but sensei was like nah nah it's too hard the vines get hard by then so you kind of want to hit it at a time there's a rainy season in japan that happens like in june july a uh, little August, and then it just, it gets like poof, like really, really humid. And so you kind of, um, I was kind of timing it. So after the rain, the vines go super fast. Um, I'm not sure what it's like in Georgia or in the American South, like what folks are um, harvest, how, what their timing is like, but it's probably pretty similar. Um, and then it, in the fall, it turns yellow, loses leaf, and then is basically underground. So the underground system is huge root system um, that shoots out tons and tons of, we call it the runner vine. So if you guys are wanting to work with it in, in the Cordillera, the runner vine is like the one that shoots out ping, like really, really long and straight. 
there are also ones that climb up into the trees. Um, and like when I was in Okinawa, the, the kuzu that I harvested there, there were some that were going ping like super straight, but that was in November already. And their, their system is a little bit different. It wasn't as hot and maybe in the summer it's, it's hotter and more abundant, but I did, I wasn't finding as many runner vines. I was finding more stuff climbing up into the trees. So what I took down then was harder. You, you can still get the fiber from it, but it's just harder to do. So the soft, fresh, new straight vines that come in the summer were the best ones. And that's what Sensei told me to, to harvest. Yeah, the reason uh, this question is being asked is, of course, aside from war, um, we also look into the effect of climate change on the kutsu. Like uh, if there's a peak season and then it lowers in November. So I was wondering if in your study you have observed the, the growth and development of this particular fiber. And uh, of course, in relation to the work of the weavers, no? when they harvest, when is the best time, where is, when is the low time, and if there are low season, how can we actually increase no? in terms of you know, all of this climate change going on um, to, uh, right now? That's a great question. And, you know, like I said, we just had the snow. Um, and then in the summer, this this snow to me is also rare for Hiroshima. So I have noticed that the weather is different the past couple of years. It hasn't been that consistent. It has been a little bit different. Um, but I think to me, it was so hot for so long this year. And it was so hot. I mean, it was way more way hotter this year than it was even the last year. Um, but I did notice that even later, like in September and October, there still were those long runner vines. So maybe it, it, because it stays hot, it could extend that season even longer. I mean, I wasn't taking it at that time because I thought, oh no, Sensei told me not to take that one, so I shouldn't take it. But it it could be that the season is becoming longer because the weather stays so hot for so long. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, documenting. I'm not the best, um, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not the best like do, uh, note taker in terms of all of those things. I kind of just pay attention. But um, I think if you're wanting to study it, it is the most important thing to notice is like, when does it come out? You know, because I, I have my photo documentation of, okay, here's the first, the first shoot that I see in the springtime peak, I get a picture of that. Um, and then you can kind of track it from there. Yeah. And also, thank you for showing us your slides from the Kabayan trip. So you were wondering exactly if you really found them and where they are and if they are uh, being used by our uh, local weavers there. So it is also interesting to note that they are also used for uh, soil protection uh, from landslides. So uh, I'm sure there are scientists in the UP Baguio that might be willing to explore this as a preventive uh, method for uh, landslides. Okay, uh, the, the next question is, have you also explored uh, the combination of kutsu with other uh, Philippine fibers such as cotton, pineapple, and abaca in your work? And if you have, then how does it look like and um, what are your thoughts about these combinations? I think that's a great question. And, you know, we have so many beautiful fibers. Um, I think that to me from studying kuzu, what I've found is that most weaving communities do not make their own material. And that's kind of across the board, whether it's in Hawaii or it's in Japan or Philippines or anywhere, Mexico. Um, most people buy their warp. They buy their mercerized cotton you know like what the when i went to kabaya and i was showing the weaver i said oh look auntie here's the fiber to be made and here's this and the, and she was like hmm like that looks like a total pain in the ass basically is her face you know she's like yeah we we just get regular cotton or we work with acrylic warp and weave into that and even me i mean i'm not making my own warp because who in japan in japanese we say mendokusai Mendoxai, it's annoying. It's a, it's a pain in the ass to make your own warp because it's it's important to have a strong warp. And it's not that we don't have, we shouldn't totally, you know, eschew technology because people have developed the technology of mercerized cotton so we can have stronger, better cloth. 
that comes at the expense of industrialization and blah, blah, blah. And of course, there are strong warps that are good and natural and that are handmade, but it takes time and time is money. And so if you want a relatively inexpensive cloth, you're going to go with a cotton or an acrylic uh, warp that comes from China or comes from Indonesia or wherever. Um, so to me, and this is like, if we go into, you know, like uh, the Gandhi's concept of uh, uh, no. just thinking about autonomy, community autonomy, what would autonomy look like if, if we look at our historical economic um, systems in the Philippines, they were based in cloth. You know, cloth was a valuable item. Cloth was a tradable, uh, taxable money currency item. And so if we're thinking about creating new systems of economy, then we need to also think about how do we create and own and produce all of our own materials. And that was one of the reasons why I became interested in, in Kuzu is because you could. And I could, in fact, I have a friend who went to a, a wisteria the Fuji Fuji Fu workshop and she was sharing pictures and I said are you guys making the warp she's like yes we made all the warp this year for next year's workshop so from the Fuji which is wisteria vine climbing up in the mountains here so you can do it and I haven't worked with that much other I've worked with a little bit abaca and um, Professor Ikin gave me some beautiful abaca and cotton when I was there that I haven't even worked with yet um, but I think the inter, I think it's important to make our own materials and cross them and hybridize them with other stuff, because that is the true expression of how our world works in a globalized world. Like we're not living, I mean, props to the farmers and the weavers who are on their farms, making all their own stuff. Like you got time absolutely it's it's important to do but if we're living in a world of commodified everything else we also need to mix the materials and i think it's a beautiful way to also support the people who are making so if anyone really wants a job um, we need to that disconnect between the people who are making the actual material and the people who are weaving there's that disconnect between the material and the weaver and to me i think we talked about this professor ikin that is the sweet spot we can figure out how to make that process good and um environmentally friendly and create jobs for people to create that material that is a key key point in i think all of our research how we can support the people making the material Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Now we go to the questions from our participants. Uh, we have a question from Gay uh, Ekos Chalcita, uh, and uh, she's asking: After the ends are knotted to join the fiber lens, what is the tensile strength measurement for kusu threads? I don't know off the top of my head, but there are measurements, and it depends, of course, on the thickness of your thread. Um, I really like being crazy about it and making super thin. I like really, really thin. I use a needle to split the fibers into like, like a, I don't even think I have, I have some right here. I'll just show you really quick. This is the, this is the fiber just gener generally, but if you can kind of see this, this splits, I can put my nail through it and it'll just keep splitting and splitting and splitting. So the tensile strength, I believe the thicker it is, you're going to have a different strength. So it depends on the measurement in the millimeters, but um, I can try to find that and send that to you guys. So you have a sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there's a question from an Ilocano. Uh, and she said, as an Ilocano myself, knowing what my grandparents have gone through during the Japanese occupation, how are you reconciling this part of your history or lineage, learning, Japanese crafts, plants, traditional practices, language, and others? Do you find it a healing process? Oh, th thank you for that question. Agyamanak. <laughs> um you know, that's such an interesting and important part of my process. And in fact, that is the reason why I came to Japan is because I knew that in our family history, we have a history of, you know, of being occupied of, of um, you know, my grandmother would tell me stories of the war and having 
to dig the hole in the backyard to put all the girls, all the sisters would hide in a hole in the backyard. They would cover it when the Japanese were coming. And we don't know our family history where we came from because the Japanese military burned down the church with all the records. They burned down the town. Um, they had to run and live in Mount Balungao in Pangasinan. They lived in the mountains for months. Um, everyone in the Philippines, it's it's historically documented that the Japanese occupation of the Philippines was the most violent epoch time of of the many occupations of the Philippines, the American, the Spanish, the British who were even there, you know. Um, so to me, I believe that this work is that work of healing and that work, um, you know, we talk about um, uh, Cynthia from Weaving Hand, I remember in, in Brooklyn, she talks about the 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 loom uh, as the womb, you know, or like the, the, the weaving coming out of the womb. And we have an immense, immense history of sexual violence and trauma, not only from the Japanese sex slavery and the military occupation times, but from way before. And it's not just for women. I mean, the just the torture, the awfulness of war um, that Filipinos and have all had to experience, all different peoples of the world. But, you know, in our particular context, um, this is to me, it is that work. And and I'm writing about it and I'm thinking about it a lot. And I, I hope that other people receive that from the presentation. Um, I'm, I came to Japan because I didn't want to have a personal hatred towards Japanese people, um, even though in my family history, you know, people would tell me, why are you going to Japan? Don't you know what they did to us? Don't you know those Japanese people, blah, blah, blah. But I, I believe that um, these are these are wounds that we can tend to, that we can heal, and that this process of understanding how people are victimized by governments you know people are in general are victimized um, by nash nation states and war machines and these really big systems which are also individual people making choices right um but i believe that in our face-to-face -face interconnection you know me talking to uh, someone every night at the dome or me uh, hearing the story of hibaksha and receiving their teachings or um, talking to people in the cordillera about the histories and hearing their stories of occupation and war like i think those are the ways that we that we heal and that we can understand each other and we know we all have the same experiences and therefore why do we continue to you know invest in war and the economies of war so yes i i think that question is so important and it is at the heart of my process and it's at the heart of why i came to japan is because i wanted to understand japan and japanese culture learn from this place so i can forgive and so i can also apologize as an american to what has happened to japan you know maybe it's not my personal fault that um, you know, the, that the Americans dropped, uh, that they that they destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the way that they did. But I live in the post aftermath experience as an American person. And I do believe that we have a responsibility to talk about these issues, and how they continue uh, to perpetuate violence around the world. So yeah, it's, it's all we all have a responsibility to address our own you know victim story and our own perpetrator story and so i think in the work here you know thinking about the mountain and thinking about the plant and how we're all connected is totally totally um that kind of work so yeah thank you for that that really important question oops i cannot hear you professor Okay, thank you so much, Rebecca, for that sharing. And uh, we have come to our time. It's 11.33. So um, do you have any last words to our audience and also looking forward to your work um, in the Philippines later on in collaboration with uh, Corditex in the future? So uh, to wrap up this uh, webinar. 
Yeah, um, I think the only thing I have left to say is that please feel free to contact me. Um, I can put my email in the chat. I think I uh, finished my presentation, had a slide at the end, but I'll just put my I put my Instagram, I'll put my uh, email there. I also have a Patreon where I'm writing a lot about my work. Oops, there's my website. Mm -hmm. I'll just put this stuff. I think that's correct. So that's all my contact info. Um, please reach out. I'm I'm this is not a, like this this work. This is my dissertation work, but it's really a hugely collective process. And uh, I am not I just want to share as much as I can and I want to receive as much as I can in exchange with people. So wherever you are, if you have a question, just reach out, feel free anytime. And um yeah, I think the only other thing I really have to say is um, free Palestine, <laughs> free Palestine and, and free all of our lands from all of the wars. And we have to keep paying attention. And, and I just sending a lot of gratitude to um, Professor Ikeen and the Cordytex and all of the uh, team at UP who made this happen. And thank you for giving me the platform to talk about my work. I, I'm just very grateful. Arigatou gozaimasu. Agyamanak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marami Salamat, Rebecca, for sharing your um, knowledge and, of course, your advocacy to Corditex. And I hope that we meet you again back here in UP Baguio and share uh, your work with us. And hopefully we can collaborate in the future. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending our webinar this afternoon, uh, this morning. Then uh, next next month, we will have another interesting uh, weave scholar also, textile scholar. We'll talk about her work in um, in a local community, in, a, in, a, in an indigenous community in Southeast Asia. So with that, we thank Rebecca. Maraming salamat sa iyong oras. Agyaman kami uh, for your time uh, this morning. Thank you, everybody, and see you in the next webinar. Bye. Bye. Salamat. Salamat. Bye-bye.